Good afternoon. Welcome to the Kabul experience. As chairman of the Mental Health Committee, may I say on behalf of the entire committee how very glad we are that you have come to this presentation. I should like to thank the many people who have been instrumental in arranging this afternoon's program. In addition to the Mental Health Committee, the Office of Medical Services, the Director General's Office, the Family Liaison Office, the Foreign Service Institute, and the International Communications Agency have all made enormous contributions, some in the form of financing, all in the form of moral support, logistics, and just plain work. Our thanks to all of you. I should like to read to you a letter we received from Mrs. Carter. Dear Betty, thank you for telling me about the Kabul experience. As you may know, the President's Commission on Mental Health, on which I served as honorary chairperson, gave high priority to the prevention of mental illness. It is clear that one of the greatest obstacles to more effective prevention efforts is our unwillingness to admit that not only do mental problems exist, but that we must begin to speak openly about them, removing the stigma so often associated with them, seeking ways to deal with them before they become serious. I commend the Mental Health Committee for its public presentation of the Kabul experience. I hope this will be but one of many steps to encourage greater awareness of mental health problems. We must acknowledge their existence and dedicate ourselves to finding new ways to prevent them. Sincerely, Rosalind Carter. May I now present our panel members here on the stage. As the Kabul experience unfolds, they in turn will introduce the other participants at Kabul who are seated in the audience. Ambassador Ted Elliott, who many of you know, was most recently <laughs> was most recently our ambassador in Kabul and was instrumental in getting the program going. Dr. Pettinga. <laughs> regional medical officer for the area at the time. Dr. Westmas. <laughs> the first mental health expert at post. It gives me great pleasure to present a person we all admire, not only for his tireless efforts in the field of diplomacy, but also for his interest in and concern for the people who work with him throughout the State Department, Secretary of State Cyrus Vance. Betty, Ted and Mrs. Elliott, guests and State Department colleagues. <clears throat> I'm very pleased to be able to personally express my full support for the important work that is being done by the Mental Health Committee and by our own Family Liaison Office. I particularly want to commend all of you who have organized this program today. At the opening of the Family Liaison Office almost a year ago, I spoke of the importance I attach to meeting the needs of the entire Foreign Service family as well as the Foreign Service officer. A healthy and stable Foreign Service family is essential to the successful conduct of our responsibilities. Here in Washington, and particularly in overseas posts, which can place a strain on family life. Without strong Foreign Service families, we won't have a strong Foreign Service. I'm greatly encouraged to know that a growing number of posts have developed programs designed to raise the morale and improve the quality of life for Foreign Service families. They've been initiated in places as diverse as Tokyo, Bonn, Singapore, Rome, Kuala Lumpur, Vienna, and Kabul. The Kabul experience about which you will learn today was a successful, innovative, and effective experiment in improving morale at one of our most challenging posts. Kabul is a different, difficult, and isolated post. And many of the problems that face Foreign Service employees and their families are particularly acute there. There was an enormously high number of medical evacuations, suicides, and a serious teenage drug problem. 
The people who creatively tackle these problems with such notable success are with us here, and they will tell you what they did and how they did it. At a time of limited resources, it is essential that the many agencies representing the United States abroad work together to build the strong sense of community and the strong sense of purpose that can contribute to our overseas efforts. We must find ways to support such programs. As you learn about the Kabul experience and discuss what we can learn from it, I want to underscore that your efforts have the full and enthusiastic support of Mrs. Vance and myself, and I shall do everything that I can to work with you to help in furthering this and similar programs. Thank you very much, Betty. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. I should like to say just a few words about the Family Liaison Office. Under Janet Lloyd's leadership, it is constantly seeking ways to improve the quality of life for all of us, as the Secretary said. There are now over 30 overseas Family Liaison Offices, many of them providing counseling or having referral services for counseling, along with their many activities for the benefit of everyone. They work closely with the regional medical officers and nurses at post. Here in Washington, Flo acts as liaison between the medical and personnel divisions and the members of the family's medevac. When the panel has finished, Dr. Haynes, Director of Mental Health Services in the Office of Medical, health, uh, Medical Services State Department, will give us an update on the Kabul Regional Program. And we hope to have time at the end of the presentation for a question and answer period. I should like now to turn the meeting over to our three panelists. Uh, Mr. Secretary, Mrs. Vance, Betty, I think I have to say at the outset that those of us who worked on the problems that we uh, saw and faced in Kabul are immensely gratified at the support uh, we received in those days from the department, and we're, of course, immensely gratified by the support, Mr. Secretary, you have given this, this effort by the support uh, that this effort has gotten uh, throughout all the foreign affairs agencies. Uh, the three of us, I think, sitting here and the many others who worked with us both in Kabul and here in Washington in all the agencies um, have to feel, uh, being here on this platform today, that we got something started. And I think it's something extremely helpful, extremely useful, extremely important uh, for the Foreign Service uh, as a whole, and I'm not just talking about the State Department, I'm also talking about AID, ICA, the Peace Corps, the various defense agencies, and so forth. The, I also want to reiterate that we panelists alone are not responsible for what happened uh, in Kabul, for the program that existed in Kabul. Many other people uh, helped us. Many other people played major roles in this effort, and of course, with the exception of Frank Pettinger, uh, many other people are going to be carrying this on uh, in the future. Let me give you a very brief history of how the Kabul mental health program got started. It begins with a conversation that Dr. Petting and I had in the early fall of 1973 before either of us were assigned to Kabul. Uh, we met here in the office of the desk officer of, uh, for Afghanistan, and we talked about some of the problems that we thought might be facing the American community, then about 600 strong, including uh, men, women, and children uh, in Afghanistan. We, we uh, uh, thought that this was going to be a, a difficult experience in many ways for us as leaders in, in a community, in a country which is very isolated geographically, and also a country where, for cultural and political reasons, the American community is to a very great extent isolated from the local community. Uh, uh, the problems of isolation and claustrophobia impose special pressures uh, on the, the American and the rest of the foreign community in, in Kabul. In, uh, in addition, we were aware uh, that there was a serious teenage uh, drug problem. When we both arrived in, in the later part of uh, the fall of 1973, we stayed in very close touch with each other. Uh, Frank Pettinger took the lead in getting a teen center uh, started. 
Uh, we worked together to revise a, a drug abuse program for the community, which when we arrived was, was a punitive program. That is to say, uh, anybody involved in drug abuse uh, was, uh, after a, a due number of warnings, to be expelled from the country. We found that this was not working. Uh, the children of senior officials of the mission, for some reason or other, weren't being sent home. Uh, that um, the, the, the program needed to be altered, uh, and we did alter it to emphasize that a drug abuse uh, question, a drug abuse problem, should be addressed first and foremost in the family, uh, in the community, and with the medical services that are available, and only as a last resort should one think about disciplinary action for the members of the family or for the employee uh, involved. And I think it's fair to say that in the succeeding months and years, uh, at least I cannot recall any, any time when I had to uh, take disciplinary action against an employee or a family member once we got this program uh, going. Uh, the next thing uh, that happened uh, was that Dr. Penninger came to me one day and he said, you know, I think our problems are sufficient here that we should see if we could get a professional a mental health person on our staff. And we then launched on a project to convince the medical division back here that Kabul would be a, an interesting post to start an experiment with a full-time mental health practitioner. And the net result was in the summer of 1974, Dr. Richard Westmus, who is a clinical psychologist, arrived on the scene. I'm gonna let Dr. Penning and Dr. Westmus uh, give the details of what they did. Suffice it to say that Dr. Westmus a uh, program was such a success that by the summer of 1975, the department had decided that he should expand his activities to include foreign service posts in India, Pakistan, and elsewhere in that area of the world. He was followed himself when he left Kabul in the summer of 77 by a psychiatrist, Dr. Elmore Rigamer, who is still in Kabul although there was some thought being given to transferring his home base uh, from Kabul uh, to New Delhi for, for transportation and political reasons. That's the brief history. Let me say just a word about the role of, of the ambassador uh, in an exercise of this kind. And I think what I'm saying about the role of the ambassador applies also to the role of a DCM, uh, to the role of an administrative counselor. Uh, of course, it's first and foremost uh, important for the leadership of a mission uh, to support a program like this. And uh, we, I think, in Kabul, the, uh, the DCM, who during most of this period was Ted Curran and the administrative counselors who I see in the audience today, Paul Kelly and Don Woodward, and the chiefs of the various other elements of the, of the mission did what we could to see that Frank Pettinger and Rich Westmus got the logistic and other support and also the support from Washington uh, that they needed. But I think what I want to stress uh, most particularly is, the, is how essential it is for the administrators of a mission uh, to stay out, completely out, of the doctor-patient relationship. Uh, we, uh, from the very beginning, uh, Frank and Rich and I were very concerned uh, that this program would not work uh, if uh, potential patients thought that their consultations with Rich Westmus were going to come to my attention or to the attention of anybody else in a position of authority uh, in the mission. Uh, we succeeded uh, in maintaining this confidentiality. Uh, there were occasions where Rich would feel that a certain patient, uh, his job effectiveness or her job effectiveness was being affected by mental health problems. There were some cases where medical evacuation uh, seemed to be uh, a possibility. In cases like that, uh, I was informed, or the DCM was informed, or the administrative counselor was informed merely of those facts. We were never brought into, we never were asked to be brought into any of the details of any of the therapy or consultations uh, that were, going, that, uh, were uh, in progress. I might also add that uh, my wife, who's sitting here in the front row, was also throughout this program extremely supportive, but of course she, <coughs> Uh, also had absolutely nothing to do with the inner workings of Rich's or Frank's work in, in this field uh, other than to make it clear to the members of the community that she was uh, wholeheartedly supportive of the effort that was being undertaken. I think um, this program was successful. Uh, Frank and Rich will give you some details which will, will support that, uh, that, um, that statement. The, uh, I think that 
that this program is something which commends itself to all the agencies working abroad uh, for the United States government. For all these agencies, the principal resource is people. And the effectiveness of our people overseas should be a paramount concern to the management of all these agencies. And of course, that, that effectiveness is in turn affected uh, by the health of the families of the employees. Uh, I would urge that, that uh, all of us go away from this meeting today thinking about how we can use this experience in other places in the Foreign Service, how we can make uh, resources available uh, to carry on this work, not only in South Asia, but in the other parts of the world. After all, Americans have mental health facilities uh, available to them at home. I think it's high time that similar facilities were available for the Foreign Service. Thank you very much. When people talk about the experience in Kabul, two questions come up so frequently. One is, do Foreign Service families really have more problems than most American families? And to that, I would like to say an emphatic no. I was in practice in Michigan for many years before coming to the Foreign Service and dealt with families. And after going to Kabul, found that Americans are the same no matter where they are in the world. They did have some different stress situations that they were exposed to in Kabul that Ambassador Elliott was just speaking about. Certainly, uh, we did uh, have uh, parents who, in their diplomatic responsibilities, felt they had to go to uh, cocktail parties and uh, working uh, dinner meetings and uh, affairs at the uh, Pakistani embassy, et cetera, four or five or six nights a week, leaving their children home. Yes, that's true. But we find that also in the American businessman. Uh, yes, we did uh, have uh, drug problems, and they were significant, but uh, no more so than in Muskegon, Michigan, where I came from. Uh, we, a characteristic that was slightly different, of course, was the high school senior who was going to be out of the nest the following year, going to a college in the States, and for once being on his own and being very apprehensive about that. But we have that experience also in families back home. The other question is, what happened in Kabul that was so different that you needed a psychologist there? And again, Kabul was no different from many of the other foreign posts around the world. In my last experience, I covered 41 posts in Europe. And the same stresses, the same problems, the same difficulties were present in all those posts as they were in Kabul. Some slightly different, of course, depending on the, the number of uh, parasites that were involved in a particular area. But certainly, families were under the same stresses. And so Kabul was no different than any other post that I've had an opportunity to be uh, acquainted with. When I first came into the department during my indoctrination here, I was briefed on my responsibilities and that these would come under two main categories, certainly treatment of disease as it existed. But even more important was the prevention of disease or the prevention of problems before they arose. As far as treatment is concerned, uh, these were usually fairly straightforward. They were not much different from a practice back home, except for a few things like, again, parasites. But uh, prevention, this uh, was a bit different because we had circumstances that were a little different than the usual American community at home. And we uh, looked at the different possibilities of how we could prevent some of the mental stresses from occurring and becoming significant and being transferred into physical problems. Ambassador Elliott uh, briefed you just uh, a moment ago about his change in the, in the policy of drug enforcement, what to do about the person who is utilizing drugs and over a period of warning would still use them. Should we send them home or not? No, we decided not to because you, all you're doing is transferring a problem to another community, and you're not doing that person any serious good. Usually, you're not doing him any, any benefit. We uh, 
saw that there was a need for a youth center, and uh, we got to many of the leaders of the community together, including the Elliots and the Currens, the head of the different uh, missions, the aid director, uh, Vince Brown, the uh, Colonel Eliason from the DOD, uh, Jerry Werner of ICA, and we got these people together on a couple of occasions, presented the problem to them, and they all agreed, yes, they thought that a youth center would be uh, advantageous. And it's surprising once you present the problem to a community where your resources come from. Aid pro provided a, a house. And uh, one of the people on the mission provided a car for a, uh, an old car for a mechanics shop. And there were some um, photographic equipment. And another man donated his uh, talents in, uh, in that regard. And so it went on and on. But I must say right at the outset that unless you have good leadership for this kind of a project, it's going to fall pretty much flat on its face. And we had that experience the first year. We had a leader in this group that in the youth center that was not well qualified. The following year, we went to overseas schools, asked them for a grant so that we could hire a person from the Mott Foundation and the University of Michigan who was trained in community projects and community leadership, and it was much more successful. Still left many things to be desired, but certainly the principle that you need a well-qualified person to handle a particular project came forward very clearly and it was much more successful the second year. My wife, uh, who isn't uh, here today because she's a new grandmother, and, uh, the, and uh, the Dr. Gist, who was a superintendent of, of, of schools, and I put on a seminar, again in the preventive area, this was a family involvement training seminar that I had uh, learned a lot about from Rich Westmus in my days in Michigan. Uh, this was a seminar for parents on how to improve communication in families. What do you do if uh, your youngster is, seems to be going off the deep end and you don't seem to have any communication with them to make any influence? Uh, surprisingly, we had a, a great response. We limited it to 12 couples, but we could have doubled the size of the seminar the first time. And I never forget the third session when one of the mothers came back to that session saying, just her face all aglow, I had an hour's conversation with my teenage son last night, and that's the first time that's happened in two years. You can imagine how good that makes you feel. We uh, also uh, got meaningful jobs for students in the summertime, and the, the clue there is the meaningful job. If you make a job that that child does not feel is worthwhile and he's just putting in his time, it's not going to be a good experience. But through, again, uh, Ambassador Elliott and the aid director primarily, we did find meaningful jobs for the, for the students. Well, we, we were going through these projects, and once you find that you do present a listening ear and that you are available to listen to problems, suddenly problems come out of the woodwork. And because of these things that we had going and because of the fact that uh, people knew that they could come to the medical unit for any kind of problem, we suddenly were deluged with all kinds of problems from many different kinds of people and to the point where we felt that we needed expert advice. I had taken a uh, seminar with Rich Westmus a number of years before on this family involvement training, or similar to the parent effectiveness training that many of you know about. And uh, we talked to the ambassador and he agreed. We talked to the heads of the different agencies who were going to have to support our projects financially and they all agreed that this would be a good idea and uh, we went to the Department of State, to the medical section. They also thought it was an excellent idea, but as usual, there was an austerity program going on, there were no slots, and we couldn't get a man from the States to uh, help us out. Fortunately, Ambassador Elliott, uh, uh, and through the admin officer, who was that time Paul Kelly, and later on Don Woodward, who followed Paul as admin officer, and these men really are experts in finding ways around, legal ways around <laughs> regulations and around government agencies. And they did make it possible so that we could hire a clinical psychologist in a contract basis at post. It was done through the medical department. They interviewed Rich. 
they passed on his credentials, and it was the, with their blessing that he came out. And uh, we feel that the total experience that he will elaborate on was a, a very much of a success. One question, again, old timers or people who've been in the department for a long time say, we did it on our own. We didn't need all this extra help. We were able to support ourselves. And it is true, and we give those people credit. But these days, we find that when we do help people out, and we do make them more efficient, the Department of State is the gain in addition to the individual person. And I think we could prove many times over that we were effective in maintaining the efficiency of the department. A brief example, before Rich Westmas came, I was involved in 11 people who, for one reason or another, had to leave post early, an early transfer, or are not allowed to come back to post, or are medically evacuated for some, some kind of psychological problem. After Rich was there, we didn't have a single one, or very few, I should say, including the three suicides that Betty was talking about, who we kept at post, who remain very effective, and we suicidal think... Suicidal attempts. Suicidal <laughs> attempts, right. <laughs> <laughs> suicidal not attempts. Not no. We don't bring people back to life. <laughs> In summary, what are some of the factors that I see for a successful program? Number one, as I alluded to before, the mental health worker that you hire or find or arrange for has to be competent. If he is a poorly qualified person, the program will be a complete failure, and the whole idea of a mental health program will go down the drain. If you have a good man, it'll support itself. And so from this standpoint, I think any future program should have the approval of the medical department, should have the approval of the, of the person who is going to go into the field. Second thing, you should certainly have the approval, backing, support by the whole community, from the ambassador on down, the DCM, the heads of all the departments, the school superintendent. If you have two-pronged programs who are in competition with each other, I think you'll have problems. In Cabo, it's fortunate we had a very, a, a very willing group who were willing to work together. Number three was also alluded to assurance that the mental health records will never become a part of the official record. The doctor-patient uh, confidentiality must never be violated, and this is very important to, to be successful. And the third thing is to have an admin officer who knows the way around the ropes to <laughs> allow it to be done. Thank you. I just wanted to ask one question right now. Uh, was the term man generic, or could we assume that a well-qualified woman might also be? His wife isn't here today. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to begin by saying that it's just delightful to be back in Washington amongst old friends from Kabul and meeting new friends. Uh, my wife, who's in the audience today, uh, and I have been in Michigan since, uh, since we left the Foreign Service last year. And uh, I should mention, too, we're in a small community called Cadillac. Uh, my overseas experience working with a small American community has been excellent training to work in a small rural-type community back home because the small community dynamics, the fishbowl atmosphere, everyone knowing everyone else in their business and so on, has a lot of commonality between these two settings. I'd like to answer a question that the others have already alluded to that nearly everyone who's talked with me about my experience in Afghanistan has asked, and that is, why Kabul? The assumption is usually made that Kabul is unique in having more than its share of problems. There must have been some tremendous crises going on, terribly unmanageable, and so on. Well, Kabul has its share of problems, to be sure, but so do other posts. And as I later had a chance to visit other posts in Pakistan, India, and in Nepal, and, and <coughs> Bangladesh, and Tehran, Kabul certainly had no more than its share of problems, and I don't think was any more difficult a post than these others. What Kabul did have, as you can now see very clearly, was 
a group of people uh, such as Frank Pettinger and Ambassador Elliott and many others who recognized mental health problems when they saw them and were not so paranoid about admitting them that they saw the need to get some help. It's really impressed me, especially as I've gotten together and heard more of the story. I came in sort of halfway, as you can see, uh, as to how many people it took to work together to put this program on and to make it function. And I came in at a stage where success was almost guaranteed, I felt, because there were so many good things that had already gone on to prepare the way for what I was to do. And along with the uh, support and spade work and intelligence support at Post, of course, there was support from MMED. And uh, I had very little orientation, by the way, going overseas. Perhaps some of you were in that boat, too. Uh, we stopped very briefly in Washington, about three or four hours, as I recall. That was uh, our orientation. Uh, but uh, one very important thing happened. I, I asked uh, Dr. Carl Nidell, who at that time was the medical director, about this question of confidentiality. I said, who in their right mind would see a psychologist if they're working for the government? And uh, he assured me that Med had no interest whatever in knowing the names or the details uh, of the clinical work that I was doing, that the only time this information would be important was if there was a medical evacuation, and they would, of course, need the background, which was fair enough. So I made a plan then to keep my notes in longhand pencil. They went through a shredder when I left, except for a few that I referred on to my successor, Dr. Rigamer. But uh, there was great cooperation in ensuring confidentiality. There was also support at post, which was uh, continuing and vigorous. And the last ingredient was a number of people with problems. And uh, you need that. Uh, a psychologist needs people with problems like a teacher needs students, you know? They go together. Well, there was no lack of this there, and I found no lack anywhere that I've gone. And this leads to the second question that people always ask of me, and that is, what kind of problems did you encounter with the people overseas? And I was uh, asking myself that question, too, uh, with a little bit of anxiety. I wondered if my previous experience in clinical practice in Grand Rapids, Michigan, would be sufficient to handle the kinds of people and their problems that I saw overseas. To my relief, it was. I found that people are much the same, Americans anyway, wherever you find them, and that the kinds of problems I saw in my office in Kabul, Afghanistan, were not that different from the problems I saw in my office in Grand Rapids, Michigan. The most common problems were depression and anxiety and marital problems in roughly that order, or not much difference. Anyway, those three types of problems, I would say, would account for more than half of the clinical work that I did. And teenager family relation problems would occupy another good chunk. And this is very typical of my practice right now. The first year contract was, as was already said, a pilot program. and. My job description involved direct clinical services of psychological assessment, psychological testing, and psychotherapy, individual, group, family, marital therapy. However, I found I did not do any group therapy overseas. The setting in a small community like that just did not lend itself to group therapy kind of activity. I did do a lot of individual and marital therapy and working with families in a therapeutic setting. I also saw a number of people uh, who's, who had concerns about a spouse, a child, uh, or an employee sometimes and served in an advisory role, not seeing the person who was identified as having problems, but seeing people look, I know this person won't go see you. I've talked with them about it, and I'm concerned about them. You know, do you have any suggestions? How can I, 
how can I handle? Or in some case, you know, how could I talk them into coming to see you? I know they, they need to, and uh, they don't seem to be willing to. So a big part of my job, and I, I felt really the key part, perhaps, of my job was the clinical <laughs> services area, because that is where the crucial events would occur of a person either working out the problem on the spot or having to be transferred out. And it occurred to me as we were putting together this program that we really were practicing something in the Kabul experience that has been learned a good many years ago in World War II, that it was much easier, much more efficient, and much more effective to treat the problems of the combat troops up near the combat zone and return them to action and effectiveness than to transfer them out, deal with them in a different setting with all the complications of failure, dealing with strangers, not understanding your original setting, and all of those kinds of things. And this uh, experience in World War II led to programs in the other conflicts since that have been implemented for that many years. So we're not doing something that new, and it's not, not a great surprise that people were receptive and the program was effective by the measures that we used. Another part of my job, I should mention, is consultation with the American International School. Dr. John Gist, who was at that time superintendent of the school, was very supportive and very eager to have us involved. I worked in consultation with him and in regular weekly sessions with a school counselor. I did some training programs in communication skills and helping skills with the staff, and of course worked with students who were referred to me. And then in the summers, along with assisting in the uh, coordination of the summer job program that Frank has mentioned, uh, I developed a peer counseling program for teenagers to help them communicate with each other with more effectiveness and to assist in the process of assimilation of new teenagers into the program and to attack whatever other issues related to choices in, in regard to drugs and behavior uh, that came up in the course of the program. This went on for all three years and uh, with good feedback about it. Then another part of my job was involving uh, community education, prevention, and perhaps even a better term is mental health development. I like to think even the prevention term is a little bit negative. You know, you're worried about uh, taking care of things that might go wrong. I like to think that all of us can develop to a higher level our mental health, our attitudes about ourselves, our effectiveness in communication, our effectiveness in caring about other people. And uh, some of the efforts in this direction included the program that uh, Frank mentioned, the family involvement training, basically a, a communication training program for parents, the peer counseling, which I've already mentioned, and a marriage enrichment program for couples whose marriages are basically good, but who, like all of ours, can have better marriages with a little attention, a little practice, like uh, Charlie Brown's Christmas tree. All it needs is a little love, and it'll grow more. So that was another part. And finally, uh, the, the fourth role was consultation with community organizations and community action programs, such as the Youth Center and the Teen Job Program. I was not directly involved as an administrator in these programs, more as a resource pro, uh, person and a backup and uh, support person to the program. That pretty well describes the first year of our stay. The second year, as was mentioned, I became a Foreign Service Officer, and this opportunity presented great decisions for my wife and myself and our entire family. We left with the idea of spending one year and wound up spending three. I'm sure that's happened to other people. So you may know the kind of uh, agonizing that we went through as we try to determine what uh, our course should be as an individual and as family members. Uh, the second two years then produced an added dimension of regional uh, mental health <laughs> consultation to Pakistan and India especially, but also to Kathmandu and Dhaka and Tehran. <coughs> the format for this service included referrals from the regional medical officer, 
for evaluation and sometimes for psychotherapy to the extent I could follow through on successive visits, and also involved consultation to the school, which would mean seeing students who were referred for psychological services, usually a workshop of some kind with the staff, sometimes a meeting with parents to discuss problems and mutual concerns, and consultation with the school counselor or um, the person serving that function, not always a formal position. As that program developed, I saw also another uh, need, and that was instead of just visiting these posts individually, to bring together representatives from these posts for regional consultation. And so the last two years I was there, we also had regional workshops bringing in people from the uh, various posts that I visited, sharing ideas, and most of all, sharing solutions. I was glad to uh, hear from Clark Slade that this program is still going on, that he attended one recently in New Delhi that Dr. Rigamer is now leading, and uh, a very beneficial thing, a chance to share and to compare notes. I'd like to say just a word or two about evaluation of the program. I'm a psychologist and trained to some extent in research, and I have to say from a scientific standpoint, we don't have all that great a data because it's very difficult to evaluate a program and especially to evaluate one you're doing yourself. We did try to build in from the very start certain mechanisms for monitoring and evaluating the program. I'll review them briefly. First, we had a six-month report accounting for what I did, how many people I saw, types of problems, men or women, employees or dependents, et cetera. Secondly, at the end of the first year, we developed a consumer questionnaire asking all the people who had used the services in any way to respond and evaluate the effectiveness and the helpfulness of this service and whether or not they felt it was something that should continue. We also made a special point to try to get at this factor of how many medical evacuations were prevented. You know, it's hard to do, but we got people to estimate that. Then the second and third year, uh, we did a questionnaire of the regional posts, a regional post questionnaire, asking again the effectiveness of the program and uh, how well it was received. All of these data indicated that the program was being used and the consumers felt they were very helpful and the estimates were that yes, we were indeed preventing medical evacuations. My personal impressions and personal conclusions is that it is a worthwhile program, that early intervention does pay off, that the crisis theory indicating that when a crisis is dealt with on the spot, successful resolution can be made and sometimes even a higher level of effectiveness can result rather than a diminished level. That there is a great deal of security for people at post knowing that help is available. I know that I was talked about a great deal in many homes. Shall we see Rich Westmas about this? And even though people might choose not to, the knowledge that I was there, I think, diminished some anxiety. That the final conclusion is that people working together can solve problems. Mental health problems do have answers, that many of them, if not most of them, I would like to say all, have satisfactory solutions, that we don't have to live with them, hide them, and deny them, and that people working together can do a great deal to improve the quality of life in overseas posts. I've asked Dr. Haynes to speak as our last speaker, and then we'll have our question and answer period. Dr. Haynes. Thank you. What you've uh, been treated to, of course, is really a casebook study, uh, a special kind of casebook study in community action. Uh, the special aspects, of course, uh, are that uh, the activity began at a fairly high level, if not the highest level, uh, and involved a degree of cooperation between the uh, ambassador and uh, the regional medical officer. I am here in a, uh, in a obvious, it seems to me, way to confirm something that you all know and that is that the Kabul experience is quite alive and quite well, uh, approaching about age five, 
and in the second generation hands of Dr. Elmore Rigamer uh, is also continuing to be an evolving and very lively activity. Uh, you've already heard what to me in a, in a programmatic sense is most interesting, that is that what took place in Kabul uh, could not stay confined to Kabul, uh, that the demands were such that it had to move out uh, into India, uh, Pakistan, and so on and so forth. Uh, in the last few months, I've seen cable requests uh, for uh, Dr. Rigamer's services in Madrid, I believe Rome, Tunis, uh, Tel Aviv, and so on and so forth, and there's a very important message, it seems to me, in that. Uh, at this point, we do have one uh, overseas uh, mental health expert uh, who replaced uh, Dr. Westmus after he came back to the States. And uh, with this one man, we attempt to cover a rather broad area. Uh, again, from our perspective, from Med's perspective, and uh, certainly from the mental health perspective, uh, we're very grateful uh, to the Kabul experience uh, because it turns out to be a demonstration pro project. Uh, there are obviously many, many areas throughout the world where something of this type is or could be quite applicable. So uh, we uh, are going to and have, uh, will continue to uh, take advantage of what became started in Kabul and which became uh, regional in a very, very functional sense. I think it's already been mentioned that uh, Dr. Uh, Rigamer, we plan, uh, and this is ironic that we should try to uh, rem take Dr. Rigamer or that position away from Kabul, uh, but it's sensible from a programmatic point of view to put it in a more central place where there are more uh, employees and dependents and uh, youngsters uh, and in a place uh, where transportation uh, is uh, available not only for people to come to uh, the regional uh, mental health expert but for him to move out. Uh, on the basis of the experience in Kabul and also on the basis of the experience we're acquiring from our support of the Social Development Center in Tehran, uh, which is another long story, which I won't start. Uh, but we did propose, and we are ready to propose at any time, uh, that teams be made available overseas roughly, and I must emphasize this, roughly along geographic bureau lines, depending on how many teams we have or might get. Uh, and these teams would be composed of basically uh, a psychiatrist, a, a clinical psychologist, and uh, maybe uh, at least one and maybe more psychiatric social workers. Uh, this team would, could support one another. They would not necessarily uh, be uh, based at the same uh, uh, post, but they would be in communication and could provide uh, different functions. But we are currently in a highly competitive situation when it comes to obtaining positions. You're all very well aware of the cuts uh, that are presently necessary, but I'm uh, not entirely discouraged about this because I think there's multiple evidence already, and we can see it all around us, about departmental awareness and sensitivity uh, to what I consider to be the human needs. Uh, I like very much, I like to comment on uh, Dr. Westmus's preference for the use of mental health development rather than uh, a preventive program. I like the positive aspect of that and I'd like to uh, reaffirm it. I'd uh, like to make a brief comment on what I think are some of the major things that uh, are accrue uh, from a program in which there are mental health people in the field. Uh, that is, uh, intervention can take place, early intervention, which is always <coughs> crucial, uh, with the possibility of treatment on the site. And now we can talk about such things as uh, cost effectiveness, but I don't think that's the real issue. First off, I, it's my impression that of the, uh, and I see most of them, I see them all if I'm here, but uh, medical evacuations that come back, which have averaged uh, up until this year approximately 40, and this year may actually run over 50 for the calendar year. But uh, it's my impression that perhaps 
half, at least half of these evacuations are really unnecessary. Uh, they are necessary in that they could have been handled in the field, or they are necessary because we're the only, we have to do the evaluation, you have to move the person here. Now there's something that happens when you medically evacuate a person. Uh, I can't really tell you what it is, but it's, it's not in necessarily in the person's best interest unless it's necessary. Uh, by that I mean uh, it's comparable to hospitalizing somebody unnecessarily if there was psychiatric hospitalization. It's something to be avoided if possible. Uh, so again, I think that the, what can take place in a program of this kind, again, I would stress the cost effectiveness is there when you think of what it costs to uh, pull out a family and replace uh, a family, it uh, can run uh, at least uh, fifty to hundred thousand dollars in some instances. But I think the issue is really uh, a humanistic one and, uh, in that we are uh, offering the best possible care for our own people uh, and doing our best to see that that's accomplished. Thank you, Dr. Hayes. Thank you. We do have a few minutes for questions. May I ask if anyone has a question, if you would just stand up so the camera can catch you. Yes. No, Dr. Westmark, you mentioned that uh, the problems in Cadillac, Michigan would normally not be so very different than the problems that you would find in an overseas community such as uh, Kabul. But wouldn't you, sir, find the differences of language, the differences of religion, the differences of culture, and so forth, creating a far greater potential for mental health breakdown than in your normal community in the United States. Yes, those, uh, those are realities, and they hit women. I would say dependent spouses, uh, women who do not have a career job situation going, whose life situation and role in the home is very different, and uh, in a culture where women are not very easily accepted in the streets and uh, so on, that certainly does intensify the adjustment problems. I would say, though, that at Cadillac, there's a lot of people moving up from downstate, and uh, the, the adjustment problems that some of these people from the large cities have coming to a small community where everyone knows each other and so on, they feel kind of isolated. I see the same psychological reactions, even though the situation is very different. And it's the people and their reactions to the situations that I, as a psychologist, deal with. You can't always change the situation. Many times you can't. You can do something about how you handle it, how you react to it. We have time for one more question. <coughs> yes. You Mr. spoke Kennedy. of not being able to do group work in Kabul. Is that because of hierarchy in the department or because of the fishbowl or some other reason? It would be the, the fishbowl thing uh, of those two more. Uh, people know each other, see each other socially as well as in group therapy. Uh, I found even in my uh, seminars, uh, people were probably more reluctant to disclose very much personal uh, material as compared within the states. That is one difference that I did find. But on an individual basis, that didn't bother. I have a question of uh, Ambassador Elliott. You mentioned the uh, involvement of parents, I believe, in the planning stages. Uh, my question is, did you involve teenagers, and if you did, at what point in the planning process? I think I really should ask you, Frank, to, because you were the organizer of the teen center, and I think it was really Dr. Pettinga who, re, who referred to that, and you might want to say a little bit more about how you got the teen center started, uh, because you, of course, did involve teenagers. Very definitely. We did have the heads of the departments, as we spoke about, the ambassador and the head of aid and the uh, Colonel Elias and et cetera. But at each planning session, we also had four students who did have their input and who did straighten us out on many different aspects. We had a lot to learn. There's no doubt about it. And I think this was one of the reasons why the program was a success, because we dealt with their needs as they saw it. And this is important. <coughs> In fact, it wouldn't have been a success any other way. I have a question of uh, Rich. Uh, was the services, uh, were they uh, provided to Peace Corps volunteers and used by Peace Corps volunteers? Yes. Yes, they were. Fairly extensively, in, in fact. 
I, I, I uh, Rich, you know, you'd be able to judge this better than I, but I think Peace Corps volunteers had some some special problems in a country like Afghanistan, which which AID and state and ICA and so forth employees did not have. I don't know whether the proportion of Peace Corps volunteers was larger than their community, but they they certainly, uh, I think, found this a very supportive and, and useful uh, facility. To that point, regulations say that the medical department should not be taking care of Peace Corps. But it was Ambassador Elliott's edict that he wanted the people under his jurisdiction to have the advantage, and that's why we took care of them. Have I another question? Yes. To what extent have other nations' diplomatic services expressed an interest in this or done something similar to this? And is there any liaison with other governments that might want to go into this mental health program such as you've done? I can't uh, speak for uh, any uh, other governments. I can speak for what is a uh, rather uniquely American uh, uh, enterprise in Tehran in which the department uh, has led the way, it seems to me, uh, for U.S. corporations and their people in Tehran uh, by the establishment of an outpatient mental health clinic staffed with a uh, well-qualified psychiatrists, psychologists, psychiatric social workers. Uh, the international, I cannot, I'm sorry, I don't have any answer to that. Could I ask if there's anyone in the room who would like to address uh, or answer that or give some information on that? I'd like to speak to that. Yes. In, in my experience, the Americans are the only one who take care of their own. The Germans in Kabul had one doctor who would cover about 15 countries. The British, I think, now have three doctors overseas. They used to have a fairly large medical program. Uh, the Italians have uh, four or five overseas, as far as I understand. We are actually the only country that does have programs. When a C-141 comes in after one of our badly injured patients, all the rest of the diplomatic community stands in awe and says, my country wouldn't do that for me. If I may, at this point, that the uh, Foreign Service Education and Counseling Center has received requests from foreign embassies here in Washington for help uh, in that endeavor, and uh, that uh, the Association of American Foreign Service Women get frequent requests from foreign embassies to liaise uh, in with various pertinent matters between the women's uh, affairs. Thank you very much, Leslie. Yes. I wonder if Ambassador Elliott might give some of us who are at a lower level who have the desire to try to mobilize the demand for these services, some clues on what the best way to approach our uh, senior officials might be in the field. <laughs> Go and knock on their doors. Uh, if you don't feel you can do it alone, for whatever reason, get a group together. Go and lay it out and discuss it with them. Uh, I would hope that all our ambassadors would be open enough to receive uh, visitations of this kind. The, uh, if, if, they, if they aren't, then you'll have to come back to uh, Washington, uh, come to the medical division, express a, express a need for this kind of service uh, to uh, the medical division here in Washington. Uh, but I certainly, if you, feel, if you feel the need, I think you should, you should express the need. And uh, if uh, under Secretary Reed and the other people in charge of the department's resources here don't hear about these needs, uh, he's going to feel, uh, feel that they may not exist to the extent uh, you think they do. Thank you. I think that's a terribly good note to end on. Thank you all very, very much for coming. We really appreciated it, your participation and your listening, and uh, let's all go out and fight the good fight. Thank you. Thank you.